I'm Cynthia James, and this network is about changing lives one woman at a time. Hello, welcome to Women Awakening. I'm your host, Cynthia James, and I, I am so excited that I get the honor of introducing you to extraordinary women, women that inspire me, women that are change makers, women that have learned to stand in their power and bring their gifts to the planet, which is why we're here. I really believe that this is a time for women awakening, that our energy is needed more than ever. So grateful that you're here. I do these every week. We're on Spotify and iTunes and iHeart and YouTube. You know, subscribe, come back and see us because I love for you to meet the women I love. Today, I have a treat for you. My guest today is Brenda Lee Ager. She's a legendary soul singer, songwriter, playwright, storyteller. When you listen to her, you hear songs magically brought to life with a combination of down-home flavor and a slick uptown touch reflecting the influence of her upbringing in Alabama and Chicago. Brenda has worked with great artists such as Diana Ross, Roberta Flack, Smokey Robinson, Tina Marie, Donnie Hathaway, Graham Nash, Ray Charles, Mavis Staples, Stevie Wonder, and a whole lot more, right? <laughs> Smokey Robinson said, ooh, the way Brenda Lee Ager sings, ooh, baby. <laughs> Love that. Um, and as a songwriter, she's written songs for Bobby Womack, Mavis Staples, Staples Singers, Pop Staples, Cliff Richard, The Manhattans, and many more. We are going to talk a lot about her career because it's expansive. Brenda Lee, welcome. I am so happy that you are here. I am so thrilled to be here. You told me something about myself. <laughs> I'd forgotten. <laughs> well, I just, audience, I want you to know, I have known Brenda Lee for a very long time, and I have been in awe of her who she is. And by the way, on my very first CD, she did all the background vocals, got the background singers, and we were rocking. That's right. That's right. You so know, I want to know where, where you were born and how you were brought up. Oh, that's easy. I was born in Mobile, Alabama. Mm. I am the oldest of 11 children. After, oh, bless your mama. I know. God bless her. She actually had 12. She lost the last baby. But um, uh, we grew up on a farm. Once we left Mobile, went back to the farm where my mother was from. And it was called Lower Peachtree, Alabama. There I was raised on a farm. I did everything a farmer does. Harvested, picking cotton, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, you name it. Gathering up. And we didn't even, we didn't buy anything from the store. We raised everything we ate. The three things we bought from the store, I always remember Grits, cornmeal, flour, and sugar. Yeah, four things. Uh -huh. But everything else we, we raised off the land. And we're all healthy. My mother knew, never had a sick child because we walked the land, which I find out now that walking on pure soil of the land connects you with Mother Nature. So uh, I had that automatically. And I, when, I, when I grew up, I, did, I, I left and went back to Mobile. Uh, lied about my age. I said I was 18 when I was 17. But in order to get in this club and sing, I had to say it. I have to feel bad right now. Like, oh, I told a fear of it. But I was almost 18. That, so that was my, well, I'm almost 18. That was my justification. But um, I sang there in, in, in uh, Mobile, Alabama until I went to New York. And uh, New York, was not a good place for a young country girl. I know, I did the same, I wasn't even from the country, I was from Minneapolis, and it's a wonder that the city didn't swallow me up. Listen, I went to the Apollo Theater, because that was my dream, to go to the Apollo Theater and, and, and an audition. I go and knock on the door and, and, and I said, my name is Brenda Marie, that was Brenda Marie at that time. My name is Brenda Marie, and I came to audition. And the guy looked down at me, and it was kind of like the, the guy in The Wizard of Oz when he opens the peep door and looks out and says, yeah. go away. 
<laughs> That's what he told me. Go away. <laughs> you will not be auditioning here today. And uh, six months of, in New York, I took my butt home back to my mom and back to what I knew. But then I got married and then moved to Chicago. That's how I got to Chicago. And uh, I heard this young preacher preaching on the radio. And I had this huge choir and I'm like, this is a way for me to get back to singing. I'm gonna go join that choir. And I went down to the Parkway, Parkway Ballroom, Chicago South Side. And there was the rehearsal for Operation Breadbasket. I walked in and this first person I met was a girl named Pat Henley. Mm -hmm. and, and I told her, my name is Brenda Ager and I come to join the choir. So she took me over to this tall, handsome preacher called Reverend Jesse Jackson. Who was sitting, <laughs> he was sitting in, a, in, in the corner of the room while we were rehearsing uh, with three of his associates. And uh, Patty looked at him, she said, Reverend Jackson, her name is Brenda and she wants to be in the choir. And he looked around at me and said, well, can you sing? And I said, yes, I can. He said, good, you sing singing Saturday morning. So I was automatically in the choir and he took myself, three other girls, Dolores Scott, uh, Sue Conway and Patty formed a group called the Piperettes of Freedom. Wow. And with a 21 piece orchestra, we traveled around the country with Reverend Jackson, helping to get black officials elected the first time. Okay, was, now hold on, let me just ask this question. Did you know that you were entering into a world of activism? No. I, <laughs> well, yes and no. We just wanted to sing, we were 21 years old. And we just wanted to sing, but once, once we got in and started marching and, and going from door to door, telling people they had to vote, singing on flatbed trucks in the rain early in the morning, we immediately become, yes, we're activists. And um, uh, we were there. We were, we were there in Baltimore with Walter Fondroy, uh, Kenneth Gibson in New Jersey, Carl Stokes in Detroit, Richard Hatcher in, in Indiana, and so on and on, Perry Mitchell in Baltimore. We were there on that stage singing when these guys were first elected. Wow. Okay, when, now here, I, I have a question. Yes. What was your husband doing while you were running around the country? Divorce. I was divorced. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to say that when I got to Chicago, things didn't work out in the marriage. So I was a single woman again. Yeah. Oh, okay, I was like, he must have been <laughs> raising a two year, raising a two year old but, by yourself. Raising but a we made it. We we, we wow. made it. Wow! Congratulations! We yeah, we made it, and everybody knows my daughter is a phenomenal woman. Right. You, so you should I, have talked to her sometimes. Oh, I would love that. So yeah. I want to know that I want I want to talk about. So you were singing. But how did you get to know that you were a songwriter? I love to tell this story. I was in the third grade. And when I, I, my teacher used to get so mad at me because when the kids go out and play at recess, I was scribbling on a piece of paper, my little poems. I was writing poetry at, in the third grade. And it all made sense to me. But by the time I was in the ninth grade, I was putting music to the poetry. And I would go down to the pastor sometimes in the, in, in on the farm and I would get under my favorite tree under my grandfather's pasture, take my little pad. And if I wrote about a butterfly, I wrote about a blue butterfly with red wing tips, white whiskers, black, detailed. Everything was had to be detailed. And that's why my writing is so detailed because I have to let you see what I'm saying. Yeah. When I was in the ninth grade, I heard Smokey Robinson sing, like a snowball rolling down the side of a snow-covered hill. It's growing. That right there, I said, oh my God, I got to write songs like that. Where you see, it's like making a painting, but you're doing it with words and melody and music. So that's how I knew 
I, I've always known that I'd be a writer. Yes. Yes. Well, okay. I mean, th- there's a lot to your life and I want to get I to know, okay. girl, I know. And so, so, but all right. So um, you're out there with Jesse Jackson and stuff. And then you, you start to have this career where you're singing with some amazing people. How did that happen? Well, um, Jesse told me one day, he said, my little brother, Chuck Jackson, is coming to up from the Carolinas and you try to write songs and he's trying to write songs. I want you guys to sit down and try to write something together. And so we did. Chuck and I wrote and uh, we demoed the song and he took the song to Jerry Butler. And I was working in Chicago, a single woman with a kid working at a bank. And he calls my job and he says, Lily, Jerry Butler wants to see you. <laughs> now, Jerry Butler was one of my favorite, favorite singers in the whole world. Sam Cooke and Jerry Butler. Everybody yes, knows them. Yes. One of my favorite, favorite guys. So I said, do not call me on my job. You're going to get me fired. I'm not supposed to talk on the job. So I hung the phone up and he called me. He kept calling me back. I know I lie a lot, but this is don't lie. Jerry Butler wants to see you. He heard our song. So sure enough, I went to Jerry Butler's office and I could not believe I'm sitting there talking with Jerry Butler and I'm sitting all poised. And he says, well, young lady, I like your song. And, it's, and moreover, I like the lady who's singing the song. Would you consider recording this song with me? And he, this is me, I'm like, well, Mr. Butler, I would be happy to do that. And all of a sudden, it just hit me on. Oh, Jerry, but I'm in your office. Oh, oh. <laughs> and I just went wild. And he said, calm down. Calm down. But that was the beginning of a wonderful um, uh, 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 professional relationship. And we had did that record. And the next records sold gold. They, they went gold. And then we did an album. And then we came out here to do Soul Train in California. We left so we left Chicago in a blizzard. When I got to California, the sun was shining. The limo driver had Bermuda shorts on and flip flops, and I knew then I turned around and told Jerry, "I'm moving here. I'm moving to California." <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, okay. So, so clearly, here you are, a big hit. And people are starting to notice you. Did people just start coming to you, asking you to sing and write for them? Yeah, yeah, pretty much so. Um, um, got a deal, a, a, a publishing deal for the songs with Warner Brothers. So they started sending my songs out. And of course, most of them and in this business, you have to try to get your songs rec- uh, recorded by other people yourself. But since I knew Aretha, since I knew Mavis, since I knew a lot of the people who recorded my songs, I, I had a heads up. Because when if they heard the song, somebody said, Brenda, write me a song. I'm like, okay. Because I feel like I can write for anybody. Because if I know that person and kind of know that personality, I know how to model something that they would like to say. See, if I, if I wrote about, if I wrote you a song, it would all, oh, oh, it would be about awareness. Mm. Well. <laughs> Okay, I I took that in. (laughs) Love it. Well, okay. So, so I need to know how you get from doing what you were doing to theater. Oh, because I because I was reading in your bio about theater. Talk to me about that. It's well, my first theater theatrical experience. Although all through high school, I would I was always the star in in the operettas and. And so I knew that acting was easy for me, but Della Reese hired me in a, in a play that she, I went in an audition and she said, stop the audition, she got the part. And I did a play with her. And from there, I did a, uh, a play with um, Maxine Wells and, and the late, great Linda Hopkins. And right, now hold on. Did you, did you know you could act? Yes, I've known that since I was I acted all through high school. Wow. 
But okay, I, so I, just, I just need to do a little, a, a little come around here. And look, I'm trying to roll it out real fast for you. No, no, no. This is great. So, so first of all, you knew that you were a songwriter and a poet and, and, and you were telling stories. You knew you were supposed to sing. And so you had no trouble walking into the Apollo or Jesse Jackson and say, I'm here. Right. Right. And you knew you could act. So I'm just thinking right here that there's a thread of knowing that lives within you. Listen, from the time I was six years old. Well, my mother told me when I was three that I said to her, I'm going to sing and travel the world, making people happy. I knew something in me knew that that was my goal. And I didn't realize all the facets of it, but I knew from time I was a little girl. And I also knew, I don't want to skip the subject, but let me just say this while it's on my mind. I also knew that there was something greater in me. I mean, as a young girl, uh, I'll tell you, I went to a a church because I was singing the church, um, neighborhood churches when I was six. And uh, I went to this church, it was an apostolic church. And and, um, the all the parishioners, all the people in there said, oh, here comes little Brenda Marie. She's going to sing a song today. And I'm just, you know, I'm real happy to sing. Right today, if you ask me to sing, oh, yes. But um, I got up and sang my song, and the minister looked at me like, hmm. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah. And everybody was just, yeah. And he was like, yeah, you can sing. You, you can sing. Yeah, you can sing. But are you saved? Oh no! <laughs> freaked me out, <laughs> and I, I, I was like, I was crying. I'm like, I don't know, but I hope so. <laughs> you hope so. You can't be saved unless you join this church, and that's the only way you'll get to heaven. Oh, I went home crying and crying, and my mother said, "Child, what is wrong with you?" It's the Reverend Little. I changed his name because I wrote a whole play about this. Right. Reverend Little said I couldn't be saved unless I joined his church. My mother, God bless my mother, little country woman in in Little Peace Street, Alabama, told me, she said, baby, God is not a building made of wood and stone. If God was a building, (laughs) you couldn't bring it home. And that's too heavy a burden for such a young child to own. So let me free your mind right here and now. She says, you carry God in your heart. Wherever you go, you're never apart. He's right there with you. Wherever you are, you carry God in your heart. I love that. You carry God in your heart. So wherever you are, God is. Didn't know nothing about science of mind, but that's what my mother told me way back up in the country. But it started me on that spiritual journey of saying, oh, I can't be wrong. I'm not wrong about what I'm thinking. That's right. That's right. I'm not wrong about feeling, you know, grateful, but knowing that I have these gifts that I'm supposed to share with the world. Yeah, well, you know what's interesting about that? I, I recently spoke at Agape and I talked about I dreams. missed it. I was out of town. Yeah. Oh, it's okay. But I I talked about dreams that, you know, it's encoded in us who we've come here to be. Yes. And it comes as dreams and it comes as visions and it comes in us speaking things that to some people sound crazy, but but our soul knows it. <laughs> My whole family thought I was crazy. I'm sure, I mind too. Mind too. They're like, you're going to do what? Girl, get your feet on the ground. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So I need to know, you have a you have a show that you wrote that yeah. travels. Tell me about it. Grace is a one woman show, uh, and it's about my life. It's, a, it's I play like eight characters, and uh, and they're all funny, and because uh, I am I'm a comedian too. I, I, I love to make people laugh, and um, I played my father. <laughs> 
who told me I would never make money singing. That's the one thing. You know, when your father or someone of authority that you really love, when they tell you something, you want to believe them because they're your dad. That you want them to be right. But in, 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 inside, you know, you have this capacity and this talent. And I learned that it will make money. I've been making money 50 years with this talent. That's right. And it was great to hear my dad before he died said I was wrong. Yeah. That is that oh that just validated and 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 so now I'm like whoa. But sometimes our our parents, our loved ones, for from their own fears, they instill that fear in you. And you have to work double hard to believe in that which you are and not annihilate the dreams that they had. But I couldn't be, I couldn't be, you know, I tried to work a day job and I passed out. The doctor said, she can never work. She can never do this. Well, what, what I love about this is that, and for anyone listening, if you have a passion that lives within you, whether it's singing, writing, dancing, drawing, whatever it is, pay attention because it, other people's opinions don't matter. What matters is the the fire in you. That's, That's right. what matters. That That's what. Right. So okay, so Brindley, I want to know. How, first of all, how do people find you and all the incredible stuff you're doing? YouTube, Spotify, any of those media outlets. Just type in Brindley Eager, and uh, a lot of information. Eager is E A G E R. Yeah, it's like eager. I'm eager to have a good time with you. <laughs> Yeah, well, I just want you to know you're inspirational to me, and I I love um, I I love the range in your voice, the emotion in your voice, whether you're speaking or singing. And so I um I ask the same last question of everybody that's on my show. Uh-huh. This show is called Women Awakening. I want to know what's the one thing from your point of view, what's the one thing that's important about women awakening at this time on the planet? Mm. To me, the most important thing, no matter what our backgrounds are, is to have an open mind. There's so much for us to discover about ourselves. And not being closed to new ideas can transform our whole lives. Uh, so much new information. Thank God for the internet because there's so much more information that we can learn. You know, I, I, um, I do tapping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, me too. And um, 10 years ago, I would have said, you're crazy if I could just tap on my and change my mood change but I always had an open mind so for me ladies just be open and watch watch how the universe will show you things if your mind is open and your heart is open I always say show me you know I'm willing show me and that would be and, and then of course Love everybody. Uh, love life. Love life. Whether it's a plant, you know, I have to take a doggone spider and just pick him up and put him outside of my house. I'm like, come on, bro, you gotta go. But um, yeah, just just love life. And you know what life is? Life is everything. Well, Brenda Lieger, um, it is so clear to me that you love life, that you love art that you love people, that you came here to be an artist on every level. And I'm so honored to know you. Thank you. And I just celebrated my 75th birthday. Oh, happy birthday. <laughs> and thank looking you. good, I might add. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, you know, you're my sister. And Oh, Lala tells me to say hello to you. Tell her <laughs> you I love her. You know that's my best friend. Uh, so, uh, 
That, that's enough. And, and have wonderful friends, friends you can count on. May not be many, but friends you can talk to, your intimate secrets, your prayer time and all that. We, we love one another. Just there again, love, love. That's right. Well, many and blessings. Laugh. And, and laugh. That's and a really good laugh. one. That's right. laugh. So I can't wait to see what you do next because I know it'll be powerful and profound. Thank you so much for being you here. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. I just wrote a new play called Walking My Brother Home. And oh. it's going to be wonderful. So look out for that. We'll keep, a, we'll keep a lookout. I love you so much. I love you too. Say so ladies, Carl. I'm going to say, 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 huh? Heidi, Carl, and your babies. Thank you, darling. Thank you. So ladies, I'm going to say the same thing to you that I say all the time. Remember who you are. Remember how powerful, dynamic, and mighty you are. Remember that you are so important that the universe breathed its life into you to come into this form at this moment on this planet. Magic is what you are. Mystical is what you are. Dare to step out. Step out. Love life. Bring your gifts because we are waiting for you. I am so honored to be with you. I love you and I will see you next week. Woo!